So today, I'm going to read a passage. It's actually the only passage in Scripture where you hear the Trinitarian for, uh, formula of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. It's not what I'd call a full-blown doctrine of the Trinity, but, but there it is. And so we'll, we'll talk about the Trinity today. And whenever I do that, it, it sort of turns into three sermons. I'm not sure exactly why. I say that because I, I try and tell you when I sense that a sermon might be a little longer because I think we have kind of a rhythm and uh, don't want you just to, you know, think I'm going on forever. <laughs> we'll be talking about the cosmic impl implications of God and I confess I may stretch some of you in the sermon, so take the ideas argue with them, reject them if you care to, because I'm probably not right. Let's pray. <laughs> Spirit of God, we ask that you will open up your text and let your word speak fresh to each generation, to us here, right now, in Rockville. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Closing verses of the Gospel according to Matthew. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain, to which Jesus had directed them. When they saw him, they worshipped him. But some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore, make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. <laughs> we Christians don't talk about the Trinity much. We really don't. And that's pretty odd, really, because the Trinity is Christian. I mean, it's really the only thing all the churches agree on. You know, the Roman Catholic Church, the Eastern Orthodox Church, Greek Orthodox Church, Russian Orthodox Church, all the Protestant churches, the only thing that defines us, we're Trinitarians. God in three persons, blessed Trinity. That's about the only time I hear it, except, you know, during liturgy of a sort. So it's odd. I'm guessing that most of you could not give me an orthodox definition of the doctrine of the Trinity. I don't want you to feel bad about that because, I mean, really, what does it matter? Does it really matter to you whether you know an orthodox definition of the Trinity? Some yes, some no, All right? A lot of people would give me the clover analogy. You know, you pick a clover and, well, it's one God, it's one piece, but, you know, there are these three petals on it. Yeah, that's heresy, okay? Because the deal is that each person of the Trinity is the entirety of God. Each person of the Trinity is the entirety of the one God. Doesn't make any sense at all, which is probably a good thing, because if it did, then we would be defining God, and that doesn't seem right somehow. But that's the facts, you know? And, and even if you can give me an orthodox definition of the Trinity, you'd still be forgiven for wondering whether it matters in a world where we have deep griefs, where we worry about our financial future, where we're concerned about getting sick or aging, losing something of ourselves, where we're worrying about our way of life eroding. We carry a lot of that, and you can ask yourself, what does the Trinity have to do with any of that? And, you know, our neighbors who are not believers can certainly be forgiven, even willing to roll their eyes, asking whether or not this Trinity, this Christian God, this idea might have something to offer a world with wicked problems. A word that's coined by Ken Wilber to mean problems that can't be solved, really. We're living in a world where 
teenager goes to a door and gets shot because it's the wrong door. Or a six-year-old girl gets shot and her father gets shot because her ball rolled into a neighbor's yard. Living in a world where women who've been counting on reproductive rights for decades have seen those rights be rolled back and worse still, they've been shown callous disregard for what that means for their health and well-being and what it means for their role in human society. Might be able to forgive it to some degree if, if with it also came enormous amounts of childcare that allowed us to support the whole family so that women could take their rightful place side by side with others. But we're living in a world with wicked problems. And it's fair to ask, what this trinity might offer us in a world where even the solutions we come up with seem to create deeper problems. In seminary, the standard way of illustrating that is the war on poverty, right? We had a war on poverty in the 60s and it created cyclical poverty. And I'll give you another, how about social media? It was there, I mean the idea, idealistic though it may be, was that it would draw people together, that everybody would be pulled together. Instead what it's done is fractured us wide apart. It's disturbing to watch. It's fair to ask these unintended consequences. You know, modernism itself was created to solve a problem. Human beings could not survive because not everyone had enough resources to live. And modernism actually in many places in the world has done an enormously good job at changing that situation. Certainly done a good job here in the US of A. This is no longer a feudal state with one person eating, a thousand people damn near starving. But what has modernism given us? Weapons of war that can destroy the entire creation while not changing human character and keeping us from our warring ways? An industry that's polluted our environment to the point that, you know, 150 years from now, billions of homes will be overwhelmed by water. And in the meantime, we have to deal with fires ever increasingly powerful storms, famine, floods, water resources always in question. What does this Trinitarian God have to offer? I mean, traditionally, what Christians have tended to offer at that moment is what we might call a rescue God. We can even hear tones of that in the psalm we read this morning, a rescue God, a call out to God, and God saves me, right? And so what does that mean for the Christian life we live now? I think what it means is we kind of balance our needs against justice, the needs for justice for everyone in the world, and we have to be reasonable about it after all, so we balance those needs, and we pray to God to get a little help around the edges of our life when we're in trouble. And, and all this so we can just kind of get to the end and get to a better place. That's a rescue religion. It's, it's pretty self-focused, actually. And that may have been fine when people believed in a three-tiered universe, you know, the earth here, the dome, the sky above, and the heavens below, and that netherland place under the earth. It may have been fine when we knew that, but you know, Thomas Aquinas said that when you're wrong in your understanding of nature, Aquinas was probably the greatest theologian of the last thousand years, if you're wrong about your understanding of nature, then you are going to be wrong about your understanding the God who created nature. And the God of the three-tier universe, that God, way too small for a dynamic, ever-evolving universe that unfolds century after century, millennia after millennia. Too small for that dynamic universe. I mean, we're talking about a God who blew up the first stars so that the elements that came out 
could be used to build your body and my body. We're talking about a God who's, who's overseen creation, who's interpenetrated creation as its love story unfolds, all the way through the mass extinction of the dinosaurs that gave room for mammals to grow and develop and to evolve and, until finally, at least at the moment, the pinnacle of consciousness has arrived in us. Is that the end of the story? In the three-third universe, it was. In our universe, not so much. This is the God who we worship. The God is huge, and this God is enormously creative, you know, in ways that we're not. I heard an entomologist speak as I was driving up. I, I really do enjoy my trips back and forth to Marin because I, I, I get to learn things, you know. And I heard an entomologist talk about uh, going to Hawaii. Now, apparently when entomologists go to Hawaii, they don't go to the beach and have fun. Instead, they look for crickets. <laughs> and she went and she looked for crickets in a field and, and she came upon these crickets and she collected some of them and then she realized that in the crickets were these fly larvae that were killing them from the inside out. And, and there are flies that are parasitic, and what they do is they listen for the cricket noise. You know, as the male cricket makes its noise, and, and, they, and they dive bomb it and plant their larvae in the cricket. And, and, well, that's great for the fly, but not so good for the cricket. Right? And, and the trouble is, that, that, you know, they can't be quiet, okay, the crickets, because then the female crickets won't find them and you won't have any more crickets. You, you see the dilemma. In fact, the entomologist was sure that if she went back in a few years, she'd find out that there weren't any more crickets on that field. But she did go back a few years later. And as she's wandering through the field, she couldn't hear any crickets, but she could see them. What was going on? Well, apparently a mutation had developed and, and most of the males couldn't make any noise. But just enough of the males could make noise that the other males hung around the noisemakers and as the female crickets came, they would be with them and there'd be crickets. And so there became this balance between flies and fly larvae and the crickets that maintained an equilibrium of that pot. The entomologist didn't see that coming. I certainly didn't see it coming as she was telling the story. That's because we don't see God coming when God unfolds an incredibly creative creation. We worry about our eroding way of life. Good heavens. God's in charge of that, not us. We wish, worship a God who created a universe where death is an integral part of the creative process, but also where new life always emerges, for love is stronger than death and passion, fierce as the grave, as the Song of Songs says. That's the nature of the world in which we live. And to recognize that and to see that unfolding, to recognize we're a part of that, requires a significant change in orientation. Which is exactly what Jesus wanted when he said to the disciples to go out and baptize people in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. He wanted a different orientation. I've told you a few times as we walked through the Gospel of Matthew about the two competing views that Matthew was arguing with as, as Judaism had their temple destroyed. The question is, how is Judaism going to develop? Right? And Matthew had an alternative, and the apocalypticists had an alternative, and the Pharisees had an alternative. Right? The apocalyptics and the, and the Pharisees rescue religions. The Pharisees, you follow the rules. Follow the rules. Be Jewish. Live into that because we're God's people and you will have a better life. You'll get through to the end and go to a better place. The apocalypticists, fatalism. All we have to do is wait until God decides to bring this mess to a close. 
rescue religion, not Jesus. Because rescue religions are focused on me, and Jesus was focused on God. What Jesus wanted at the end of this gospel, what Jesus wanted us all to recognize is that we need to know God in three ways. We need to know God, the Father, the I am, the being from which everything emerges. Jesus knew we were one with that being. That being's nature is love, and so what emerges from being is the becoming of creation, fueled by God's Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, as an ever, never-ending love story unfolds, where death goes to new life, where, where the two separate and fractured things come together in a unified and beautiful equilibrium and whole. This is a story of the perfection of the universe that we live into. God seeks your perfection, not your destruction. It's what the Holy Spirit is all about. And Jesus wanted you to know, through the Son, Christ, second person of the Trinity, that, that way that God reaches into creation and says, I'm an I and you're a thou and we're together. Jesus wanted you to know that God loves you. Amen. You. I don't care what you've done or what you think you've done or not done. It is God's nature to love you. God's nature to reach into your life Sending God's Spirit to unfold your beautiful life towards greater hope and beauty. It's what our God is about. God loves you, and so God made you for a role in this never-ending love story. Unfolding each day and each year. And Jesus asks for us to take that fresh perspective that we're not here for us. We are here for God's love story. We are here to be part of the unfolding of whatever God wants to see come next. It, it, it doesn't mean that the grief goes away doesn't mean that suffering disappears. It doesn't mean that our solutions won't cause other problems. It doesn't mean that the wicked problems will be solved so easily. It doesn't mean any of those things, but what it does mean is that God is holding your life in God's hand. God's given you a role, a purpose, for being here. And further, God's given you hope. Whatever calamity or struggle or anxiety or fear comes your way, you can know that it's God's creative move, the one that went from the mass extinction to the emergence of consciousness, the one who went from that cricket the crickets that are silent and could maintain the equilibrium. That God gives us hope no matter what it is, what reality it is that we see. And because that God loves you, you can know for absolute certain that your life is valuable, that you are being called into greater and greater beauty and perfection in this life and in whatever happens next. And that's what the Trinity has to offer us in 2023 with all our fears and anxiety. Praise God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.